Uh, okay, thank you very much for being here. Uh, this morning, some of you had the opportunity to take the tour of SYNQ. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Mark could only sketch the surface of what SYNQ is, what we do at SYNQ, but he mentioned that we do data streaming. And in this talk, I want to describe slightly more what we do. So some background, why data streaming? Until very recently, the paradigm for uh, Newton data acquisition was the so-called histogramic mode. Um, data was uh, already directly in the elect detector electronics uh, uh, histogram, uh, both in space, and this makes sense, okay, we have pixels, we have detectors with pixels, and in time. That means that you create a bin, bin histogram in space and time, and you add one plus one point to the corresponding pixel. Uh, why this? There were historically limiting factors. For example, a modest Newton flux of Newton sources, uh, electronics networks uh, and disk space were not so performant in the old days. Uh, and there were no other paradigms for data acquisition, but histogramming. The most critical point is that during histogramming, all time information is lost. You cannot reconstruct the full time information. So with modern uh, Newton sources, flux is much higher. We have more modern hardware. We can do something more. And a new paradigm emerged, the so-called event-based recording. This means that for each Newton, we store both the pixel position and the time, exact timestamp of the event. Uh, if you're lucky and your facility has a global time system, possibly higher resolution, you can then correlate the neutron that hit the detector at a certain time with all the other instrument uh, properties or the sample environment. If you have fast sample environment, you can follow the behavior of your sample while changing the external conditions. This enabled dynamics experiment. You can let your system evolve even in a, with very fast uh, sample environment, for example, and keep recording data, then you are able to correlate what happens, why. So uh, PSI jumped into this world thanks to the Brightness collaboration. Brightness is a, pro a program for e originally for ESS. The idea was to ensure that the critical challenges are met to provide high impact in scientific and technological knowledge. And in particular, we consider the work package five uh, where we want uh, live processing of data taken at ESS experiments. And what we started with is to develop a software to aggregate all these data. We have different data from different sources. I will show later. We have EPICS IOCs, we have detector data, we have sample environment, and we want to put everything together and let the client be able to connect to this data stream. We have some requirements. The system has to be, has, has to, we must be able to scale properly to be reliable, we want to run 24 seven. This does, should not stop for any reason. This means that we want redundancy, for example. Uh, we want clients and sources to be able to connect and disconnect with no failure and still be able to recover data that were happening before. This is the design that was developed after a few years in the collaboration, everything starts with a Kafka cluster. That is our broker that stores everything. This is the aggregator that we wanted. It was already present on the market. We could put our effort into the other components. So the, I will show later that the advantage here is that you can scale, you, you have a redundancy, you can increase performances just by adding more brokers. Then, as I said, we have detector redouts and we developed a tool called the event formation unit that is able to send detector data, whatever form that is, you write your own module and you can fit the Kafka cluster. 
same for fast readout for sample environment. Uh, you have a tool that trans transfer to Kafka. Epics, amazing and everything, but still we develop a tool to connect Epics to Kafka. And on the other far side with the consumers, we have the experiment control system, in our case, and in ESS as well, it's Nikos, with the file writer, that is a tool that we developed, and you can have other consumers, any, as many consumers as you want, for example, mounted in the original design. So as I say, the key component, the backbone of the system is Kafka. Uh, Kafka is a project released by Apache, it's a PubSub communication system. Uh, you can just download, deploy on your uh, machines and run it. The main features, uh, okay, uh, is that you have so-called topics, which are some sort of channels in the PubSub uh, component. You have producers that can publish messages to the topic, and you have consumers that can connect to the Kafka brokers and consume messages. You can have as many producers you want, as many consumers you want. On top of that, Kafka is structured so that you can uh, increase the number of brokers just by firing up another one and in principle, your performance is scaled with the number of brokers. But you can also configure so that you have redundancy. So you can have the same topic with the same messages rep replicated on different brokers. If one of the broker goes down, dies, the machine dies, they are all the other one that keeps collecting data. At the same time, you can split into partition, a topic into partition. Uh, basically, you write in different point of the disk. If you have a parallel file system, this is amazing. The system scales with the number of partitions up to a certain limit, and not only the number of brokers. So um, this is our Apache advertise system. It's a distributed, highly scalable, elastic, fault tolerant, and secure manner. So we are running the system since a few years and are quite happy with it. The other actors are Epix. Okay, we all know what it is. No need to spend time on it. We have Google flat buffers. As I said, we have different sources. We have different consumers, but we want the consumer to be ignorant in some sense from the source. We just want one way to serialize data and one way the consumer can deserialize data. Still has to be aware who sent this data. Does this data come from a motor? Does it come from the chopper? Does it come from the detector? And flat buffer does that for us. Uh, flat buffers let you serialize your data and gives you an amazing four, uh, with four, by four characters identifier that you can use to, de to describe your schema. So it's a schema system, you have to write your schema, you compile it, and then you can unpack your buffer as you want. But still, give, you don't need to unpack the, the message from the very beginning. You just look at those four characters and you know how to unpack, you know what's the content. Is it something relevant for me? Fine, I will spend my time, my energy into unpacking, else I just ignore the message. Mantid is not, it's not used at PSI, at SYNQ at the moment, but it was part of the design. And as I said, we developed some component of the system. The event transition unit, it's a tool, a modular tool that lets you read data from your detector electronics you can define different modules. You have a new detector, you just write a new module, don't need to rewrite the whole EFU or whatever. Uh, Kafka to Nexus is the tool that we use to write data, as the name say, from Kafka to a Nexus file. It's configurable, configuration goes via a Kafka, a uh, message in Kafka. Amazing, everything is in Kafka. Then we have the forwarder, uh, before this was known as the Apex to Kafka forwarder, as the name says, forwards Apex PVs to Kafka. And in the end, we have a small tool that we use as histogram, because in the end, in our uh, control system, we want uh, some live feedback. We want to see what's the image that, how, how the image look like. So we histogram the data. 
Still, all the original event data are stored in the broker. Uh, these are some, perform some preliminary benchmarks we did many years ago. Uh, we had a, C a GPS GPFS system, uh, the InfiniBand, and this is our scale. So according to the message size, number of partitions increase, this is just the producer. Then uh, we also have how the writing module from the file writer writes. So the limit of the system was five gigabyte, and here we were able to reach 4.8. And the whole pipeline, this is mostly to show you the scaling. One, two, and three brokers. As you can see, it's not a proper linear scale, scaling, but it's rather nice. At Sync, as, as ESS is still in development, at SyncQ, we are lucky. We have a running facility and we have two instruments that can do event staying, plus uh, potentially other two, but they are not implemented at the moment. There are some small differences. Uh, we replaced Kafka with Red Panda. It's a C++ uh, uh, broker uh, communication system. It's exactly like Kafka implements the same API. That means you can just replace fire up uh, Red Panda instead of Kafka, you get rid of uh, Zookeeper, uh, it's C++, plus plus, not Java, nice. I'm happy with it, with it. It's one year that it's running, no one noticed difference. We don't have a global timing system, uh, that's bad. Uh, we use SECO for sample environment. We don't have a specific fast sample environment system. AMO is in production since 2018 and now it's being rebuilt. It. DMC is in production since December last year. So this is how the system looks like. It's very similar. Just we have a Red Panda, we have SecOp, then Apex forwarder to Kafka, EFU to Kafka, Nikos consumer, and the users. This is how data looks like for a developer. Uh, yeah, you might be able to see something. This is an event and detector event stream. Here we have the chopper monitor. As you can see, uh, you probably hope you can see. We have an identifier, in this case is an EV42. So as soon as I see those uh, four letters, I know that this is detector data. Uh, we also use, for, as I say, for configuration and for feedback from the system. This is file being written by the file writer. So we know what's happening and everything goes through Kafka. And this is what the user sees. He doesn't know anything about the system. You just see his nice uh, scattering pattern, uh, powder diffractometry, uh, single crystal. Nice, they're happy so far. And this is how a Nexus file looks like. Uh, it's not the standard Nexus because you don't have histogram data, but we have a pixel ID for each event and we have a pulse timestamp. On top of the pulse timestamp, we have the, the, the Newton timestamp. So to determine the actual timestamp or time of flight, depending on your instrument, you just sum this number with the corresponding neutrons that arrived within this pulse. Yes, and that's basically all. Uh, thanks to Brightness collaboration, PS, uh, CNQ now can run in event, event mode, streaming event mode. Uh, the CNQ upgrade was a critical point in this we increased the, the, the neutron flux from a factor of 2.5 up to 10 on some instruments. That means that we can record data, meaningful data within a few seconds, data acquisition. Uh, we are still not able to have a completely dynamic experiment because we don't have fast sample environment or a global time system. Thanks. So, so are there questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How do we solve the authorization? Oh, <laughs> we did not solve. So there are different levels of, of authorization. In principle, you can already in Kafka define which component, which client, which consumer can connect to a specific topic. That is something that you define at Kafka level. Uh, Authorization on, on the instrument computers, there is basically none.
ever if we have our user for the instrument computer and everything is saved under that user, everyone is in principle able to read someone else's data. But that has nothing to do with the data streaming system. Nikos is responsible on that. In principle, you can you can write something in Nikos in the control system that makes sure that the file is saved with authorization from your experiment. Nothing is implemented at the well, yes, well, with Kafka, uh, as I say, you can in principle authorize the, the different consumers to consume from a specific topic. That is a, but we didn't do anything like that. We only have two instruments, it's not a critical issue. We have another one. Yeah. Question. Um, how far time range are your topics? Sorry? How fine grained are your topics? Is uh, one particular one topic, one proper um, topic? So at the moment, uh, well, we can look at here. Uh, we have one topic for EPICS IOC, for, for motors IOCs, for example, uh, one topic for the detector. Uh, Yes, but one for, for no, the sample environment in our case goes in the same topic of the Apex PVs, but it's on you. You can define as you want. Uh, but you're, you're planning to stay rather in March on those uh, At the moment, we have, I think, four or five topics per data acquisition, plus all the communication topics. But just Briefly show. We also have, uh, I don't know if you can read here, but we also define a source name inside the flat buffer. So within that topic, within that kind of data, you can also, also filter for the source. Second question, Tony. Uh, what's the maximum message size of uh, uh, in production, uh, we are around 10 mega. But Kafka is meant to be used with small messages. Still, you can increase. You, you do not see uh, performance problems there. Uh, well, I think this is what happens on the producer. We range from uh, 10 to the minus three mega, uh, 5 mega until 10 mega. Yes. There is something, yes. Okay, thank you. So in fact, there is a there is a question in the in the chat, so maybe you can answer it. <laughs> uh, yes, so the question is regarding the Control system, if I read correctly. And also that's the Exactly. So at the beginning of the brightness project, we do not only evaluated a solution for data streaming, but also the control system. Uh, in the end, we were considering blue sky, but we decided for uh, Nikos. So that's the control system that we are using. <laughs> 